Hey guys, welcome back to Med School Moose. This is going to be USMLE Step 1 Microbiology Buzzwords Part 2. It seemed like Part 1 of this video series was very popular, so thank you so much to everyone for watching. I will definitely make a few more videos for this series so that you guys can use them in your studies. As always, this information is high yield for both USMLE Step 1 as well as Comlex Level 1. If you are seeing different information in the resources that you are using, if it is different from these videos, I would go with whatever the resources you are using are saying just to be consistent with your studying. Two quick announcements before we get started today. I am super excited to announce that just a couple days ago, I turned on YouTube channel memberships. I decided to do this as a way to get closer to, connect, get to learn more from my subscribers and my members, what you guys are using to study, the content that you want to see on the future of Med School Moose. So I decided to do that. It's going to be really awesome. Some of the perks include membership badges, early access to videos, polls that are specific to members only, a lot of really great things to give you guys more interactivity and help you guys help me shape Med School Moose and the content we are going to create in the future. So definitely be sure to check that out. If you go onto my channel, there is a join button right there on the right side that you can check out and find out some more information about that. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that all of these microbiology buzzwords will be going into a deck on my Brainscape class for USMLE Step 1 prep content. Remember to use promo code MedSchoolMoose for 25% off your Brainscape account. Once you've done that, please shoot me an email or message me on Facebook, Instagram, wherever, so that I can verify that and give you access to all of my exclusive content. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, I will link the video where I discuss Brainscape to this video, and you can check it out there. But definitely recommend using Brainscape, and I will be throwing all of the microbiology buzzwords on there. With that being said, let's go ahead and get started. Our first buzzword is going to be osteomyelitis in a sickle cell patient. If you see osteomyelitis in a sickle cell patient, the causative organism that they want you to think of is going to be salmonella. Conversely, if you see osteomyelitis with vertebral involvement, they're going to be alluding to mycobacterium tuberculosis, and you may see this referred to as POT syndrome at times as well. Next one, meningitis is in an, in an HIV positive patient. Remember, if they have HIV, they are going to be immunocompromised one way or another, so they are going to be more susceptible to some of those kind of rarer organisms, one of the big ones being cryptococcus. So, meningitis in an HIV positive patient, you want to be thinking about cryptococcus. The next one, atypical pneumonia. Some people used to call it walking pneumonia. There's a couple causative organisms here that you need to know. That's going to be mycoplasma, legionella, and chlamydia. So if there's atypical pneumonia, it's going to be mycoplasma, legionella, and chlamydia. Next one here, a comma-shaped organism. If they give you that description or if they show you a picture that looks like that, they are trying to get at Vibrio cholera. And just as a reminder, this is a quick picture of that. I know this is kind of small, but the one that's highlighted right here, you can really see kind of a comma shape right there, as well as kind of a bend in some of these other organisms as well. So gram-negative, comma-shaped bacterium, they're going to be talking about Vibrio cholera. The next one, pseudoappendicitis. They love to test about these appendicitis mimics. They may even ask you straight up which of the following organisms uh, causes pseudoappendicitis. The answer there is going to be Yersinia enterocolitica. Reheated rice, this is classic for Bacillus cereus. You may remember this from Sketchy or from other resources. If a patient eats reheated rice and they become ill after that, they are hinting at Bacillus cereus. India ink stain, I've talked about this one multiple times. If they are talking about an India ink stain, if they show you this stain, they are getting at Cryptococcus neoformans. And just as a reminder, it's a very classic picture. Nothing else looks like this. If they say India ink stain or if they show you a picture that looks like this, it is going to be Cryptococcus neoformans. Moving on, cavitating infiltrates on a chest x-ray. This could be a couple different things, but really one of the big ones is going to be Aspergillus fumigatus. Okay, could also be Mycobacterium tuberculosis, but, but typically if they're mentioning something like this or they show an x-ray with these cav cavitating infiltrates is going to be Aspergillus fumigatus. Moving on here, oral hairy leukoplakia. Remember, this can be seen in HIV and other immunocompromised states. The causative agent here is going to be Epstein-Barr virus. Atypical lymphocytosis. This is also going to be Epstein-Barr virus. Remember, atypical lymphocytosis is seen in mononucleosis. The causative agent there is Epstein-Barr virus. Another uh, shape association, a bullet-shaped virus. This is going to be the rabies virus. 
bullet-shaped virus. It's going to be the rabies virus. Here's kind of a picture. You can kind of see, especially this one in the middle, it kind of looks like a bullet shape. That's going to be the rabies virus that they are trying to get at. In addition to that, if they mention Negri bodies, I know I've talked about this one before as well. This is also going to be a reference to rabies virus. Remember, these Negri bodies are cytoplasmic inclusions that can be found in neurons or in Purkinje cells of the hippocampus. I didn't include a picture on this one because there are a lot of other things that look like cytoplasmic inclusions, but just remember, Negri bodies, they are going for rabies virus. Moving on here, orchitis, the causative agent that should be associated with that is mumps virus. There's really no other associations that go with orchitis. Yes, it is caused by some other organisms, but if they are talking about it on the exam, they want you to make the association with mumps virus. This one's a little bit more out there. Warth and Finkelday giant cells. This is a bit of a tough one, but it is going to be associated with measles or the rubeola virus. The, I'm not going to include a picture for this one because it's a pretty obscure thing. I doubt they would show a picture of this. But if you see that term, Warthen Finkelday giant cells, I want you to be thinking of measles, rubeola virus. Moving on here, infantile gastritis. This is super important to know. The most likely agent is going to be rotavirus. So if an infant comes in, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, they ask you what the most likely causative organism is. It is going to be rotavirus. Moving on here, councilman bodies. If you see this on the exam, you should be thinking of yellow fever virus. And here's the association with that. Remember, these councilman bodies are eosinophilic globules, as you can see here, very pink, distinct color, and they're a sign of hepatocyte apoptosis, which can also be seen in hepatitis. Moving on, retinitis. This one is a little bit broad, but if they are talking about retinitis on the exam, especially if it's someone who's immunocompromised, a transplant patient, an HIV patient, something like that, the big association is going to be cytomegalovirus, CMV retinitis, so you definitely want to know that. Periventricular calcifications is also going to be cytomegalovirus, okay? So periventricular calcifications, we want to be thinking of cytomegalovirus. Another really important one, temporal lobe encephalitis. The big association that they want you to make here is going to be with HSV1, herpes simplex virus type 1. Remember, this temporal lobe encephalitis, they may give you a patient that has altered mental status, aphasia, they may have frequent seizures, that particular location, the temporal lobe, they want you to be thinking about herpes simplex virus 1. Some other quick facts that they may ask on the exam, the smallest DNA virus is the parvovirus. On the other side, the largest DNA virus is the pox virus. So smallest is parvovirus, largest is the pox virus for DNA viruses. Just some other quick things to note just in case there are easy questions on the exam, you wanna make sure you're getting those right. Moving on, a vitamin B12 deficiency. This is super, super, testable. I am still seeing this on my emergency medicine boards. The organism that is primarily associated with a vitamin B12 deficiency is Diphylobothrium latum. You absolutely want to know this. They may ask you straight up which one of these causes vitamin B12 deficiency or what does this organism cause and you definitely want to know that and make that association and move on to the next question pretty quickly. Moving on here, nocturnal perianal pruritus. This is going to be enterobius vermicularis. And then in conjunction with that, the scotch tape test is also going to be enterobius vermicularis. So if they have a uh, pediatric patient that has nocturnal perianal pruritus, or they ask about the diagnosis of this, remember you put a uh, scotch tape in that area, and when you remove it, you may see the eggs the organism associated with that is Enterobius vermicularis. With that being said, that is the end of this video. As always, thank you so much for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and I will see you in the next video.